All right, I'm going to ask a question, but I don't want anyone to raise your hand. This is the question. Have you ever done anything with good intention and it didn't quite turn out the way you thought? Yeah. I think we've probably all experienced that because there's a disconnect between how we see ourselves and how others see us. I remember when I was uh, just learning how to sing and, and I took voice lessons and my voice teacher is like, when you sing, she said, plug your ear because then you can hear if you're in tune, if you're on pitch or not. I see the singers nodding their heads, yes. Because then you can hear, are you, are, am I really in tune or not? And I also, when I was just uh, starting as a pastor and my services would be recorded and then I'd listen to the, listen to the recording, I thought, there's something wrong with our sound system. Because I don't sound anything like that voice on the, back in those days, the cassette tape. And I had to come to grips with, yes, I sound like what I'm listening to on the, on the cassette tape. I don't sound what, like what I think I sound like. In my mind, my voice sounds different. It's the same way that we see ourselves one way. People around us see us a different way. And depending on how well they know us or think they know us also has an impact on that. But it kind of boils down to, this is a real hard point for us to grasp, is most times we judge ourselves on our intentions and we judge other people on their actions. Because we know what our intentions are. Our intentions are good. And we do something and the other people look at it and say, they just ruined everything. Look at what they did. And so their opinion of us would be the opposite of our own opinion. Oh, we're thinking, boy, at least I tried. I had good intentions. It's not my fault everything blew up. Well, maybe it is. That's what I want to talk about today, is if we truly want to be the hands and feet of Christ to the people around us, to our community, if we truly want to be the hands and feet of Christ, we have to understand this disconnect in how we see ourselves and how others see us. Poll after poll comes out and, and shows in these polls that Christians overwhelmingly say, we are a force for good in the community. And people who aren't Christian overwhelmingly say, those Christians keep screwing everything up. Go on the internet sometime and start typing in on a search engine, Christians are, and see what pops up. I can tell you the first things that pop up when I've done it. Christians are hypocrites and Christians are judgmental. That's the first thing that comes up when I've tried that. And various other negative things. So there's a disconnect between how we as Christians see ourselves and how the rest of the world sees us. And that disconnect prevents us from speaking to the rest of the world. Because who wants to listen to... I mean, do you want to listen to somebody and get advice from somebody who's a hypocrite and judgmental? I, I, obviously not. So as Christians, we can think all we want that other people's opinions of us are screwed up. But that doesn't help us actually speak to them. It doesn't help us reach anybody. It prevents it. So what I want to do today is I want to start with this fundamental question. I was asked a, I was asked a question after my sermon last week. And my whole sermon is going to be trying to, as best I can, answer that question. Simple question. What's the answer? That was the question I was asked. Here's, I talked about two guys I know who stopped going to church. And their, their stopping going to church had nothing to do with their faith or their belief in Jesus. In fact... I could make the case that they stopped going to church because they do believe in Jesus and take him seriously. Because here's what happened. One of the guys, he sat right here with his family. Right in front of him was another family with their kids, and right over here was another family. 
For years, they went, all these people went to church together. And then he found out this whole time, the husband from the one family was having an affair with the wife from the other family. And they were living a lie. And he's like, life is hard enough. I don't need to go spend time with people who live a lie and are hypocrites. Because my life is hard enough already. I don't need to add that on top of it. And he stopped going to church. We can think, oh, he shouldn't have stopped going to church. The reality is he stopped. And we have to try and understand why he stopped. The other one was a guy went to church for years and years and years. And, 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 and there were a group of them that would go out for lunch after church. And he would sit and listen to all these people he's going out to lunch with, badmouth all the people they had just gone to church with. And after a while, he figured out, this is really unhealthy. This is not good at all. Again, life is hard enough without intentionally spending time with all these unhealthy people, with these unhealthy relationships who think they're better than everybody else, but pretend that they're nice to everybody else. So his solution is, what is adding difficulties and stress to my life? All those people at church. So what's the solution? I'm not going to church anymore. I I hear this all the time from people. Oh, I love Jesus. He's great. (laughs) It's the Christians that drive me nuts. Here's what it boils down to. We can define ourselves and how we see ourselves really in one of two ways. If we're going to read the Bible at all, one of these two ways is how we have to define ourselves. Ten Commandments, we can define ourselves by the law. I want to say right off the bat, the law is good. It's beautiful. It's a gift from God. We couldn't have any kind of a society without God's laws. But do we want to define ourselves by those laws? Or do we define ourselves by what last week at Pentecost we talked about, those things the Holy Spirit brings? Is that what we want to define ourselves by this? The Holy Spirit calling us to follow Christ. When we hear the gospel and we believe it, that's the Holy Spirit at work in us. It gathers us together to be God's people. It opens our minds to understanding the work of God. I love Peter. Peter gives me hope. You know, Peter means rock. It was a play on words. Peter was a blockhead. He spent three years with Jesus and never understood anything Jesus said or did. And then the Holy Spirit comes and he opened and he gets it all. It wasn't kind of magical he got it all. He spent three years with Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit opened his mind. He's like, now I get it. All those healings, all those sermons, now they make sense. In other words, do we want to be defined by what we do? Or do we want to be defined by what God does? What God did, what Jesus did, and continues to do. Which do we want to define us? If we want to be defined by the law, if we want to be defined by what we do, well, we either have to pretend that we never break the law and live as hypocrites, or we have to, again, judge ourselves by our intentions. Well, I meant to follow the law, which inevitably we will end up judging other people, though, by their actions. Or we can be defined by what Christ has done for us. I want to look at four instances in the life of Jesus to help us understand what that looks like and to help us understand how that can look in our lives, how we can apply this in our lives. And here are the, the ones. First, the wedding at Cana, a lame man, a woman caught in adultery, and a man born blind. I want to look at each of these. The first one, the wedding at Cana, really is just here to set the tone. Jesus is at a wedding, a reception. They run out of wine. So what does Jesus do? 
turns water into wine. He makes more wine. What happens if you're at a wedding reception and they run out of liquor? Everybody goes home. Turn off the lights, the party's over. So Jesus sees all these people together celebrating something good, a marriage, the beginning of the life together for this young couple. And he facilitates that celebration continuing. He's not encouraging drunkenness here. What he's encouraging here is this whole healthy social interaction in which these people are genuinely enjoying each other's company. That's what he's promoting. That's, I'm just, I just included that one just to set the tone for, for what Jesus brings. Now the next one, the la- uh, this, this lame man, this encounter, we see this lame man, he's lying beside a pool of, of water. And this pool was fed from, from upstream, and periodically the water would go over the spillway upstream and rush down into this pool and it would bubble up. And they had a superstition that first one in the pool, when it bubbles up, gets healed. And so Jesus sees him, he says, do you want to be healed And the guy says, well, yes, but I never get into the pool first. When the water bubbles up, somebody else always beats me to the pool because I don't have anyone to help me. He's kind of implying, next time the water bubbles up, would you throw me in the pool so I could be healed? So Jesus says, be healed, get up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks. And then Jesus says something to him. That's very important to this whole conversation. He says to him, now stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. He's implying that that the man being lame was somehow a result of his sin, of something he did. Second one, woman caught in adultery. They catch this woman, they they bring this woman to Jesus and they say, We caught this woman in the very act of committing adultery. She's clearly guilty before the law. I mean, that's 10 commands, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. The law said, you're caught committing adultery. That's a stoning offense, capital punishment. So they bring this woman before Jesus, and they want Jesus to condemn her. Instead, Jesus says, okay, Anybody here who has never sinned, go ahead and throw the first stone. And then he ignores them, completely ignores them. After a while, he looks up. Nobody's there but him and this woman. And he says, where are your accusers? She said, they've all gone. See, after Jesus said, anybody who's never sinned, go ahead and throw the first stone, they all look at each other waiting for someone to throw the first stone. But nobody will because they all know they've sinned. So nobody will throw that first stone. Eventually, they see the futility of what's going on here and they just leave. Jesus looks at her. He says, well, they wouldn't condemn you. Neither will I. She's clearly guilty. She's broken the law. Laws that came from the very mouth of God. And he says, I'm not going to condemn you. And then he says, go and sin no more. He's already lifted judgment off of her. He doesn't say don't sin anymore because of judgment. He he says don't sin anymore because the next crowd might not be so forgiving. The next crowd might have some sanctimonious person in there who really thinks they've never sinned, and they'll start throwing stones. It's like the lame guy. Stop sinning so you don't end up right back here by the pool waiting for someone to throw you in to get healed with your silly superstition. But now we need balance. So we come to this man born blind. Jesus and the disciples are walking along. They see this guy. Somehow they know he was born blind. And the disciples say to Jesus, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, nobody. 
Nobody sinned to cause this man to be born. He was just born blind. It happens. But he says, now you're going to see the power of God. You're going to see the grace of God at work. And he heals the man. No statement of go and sin no more. Because his predicament of blindness wasn't caused by his sin. He just heals him. And here's my point. With the, with the lame man and the woman caught in adultery, Jesus' immediate response to them is to reach out to them. Despite that man's silly superstition about the pool, despite that woman clearly breaking the law of God, Jesus brings them healing. Says to that woman, I'm not going to condemn you. Just right up front, that's what he says. I will not condemn you. She's clearly standing under condemnation for breaking the law. So before he says to them, you need to stop sinning, he heals them and lifts judgment off of them. And then he says, for your own good... You really need to get your life in order. Or you're going to end up right back here. That lame man, you're going to end up right by that pool. And I might not be here to heal you again. Or to that woman, you're going to end up in front of a crowd. And this crowd might throw stones. Don't put yourself in that situation again. For your own good, stop sinning. So he brings them that healing and forgiveness first. That's his initial contact with them. Just think how different it would be if, if the experience of all those people out in the wider world, their first experience with Christians was this. Coming beside them. Reaching out to them in their time of need. I'm going to tell you a story sometime. We don't have time for it today. I'm going to tell you a story sometime about friendship and standing by your friends when they are wrong. That's a true test of friendship. Can you stand by someone when they are wrong? Can we as Christians reach out and bring God's grace and forgiveness to people whose lives are a mess? whether it's their doing or not. If if we truly want to be the hands and feet of Christ and be Christ to the people we encounter, there's there's a big change we need to make. And it's in our minds. It's in our thinking. Because this is kind of the process. Right? Our brains work in a certain way. We think in a certain way. And that thinking causes us to make decisions. And then that decision that we make leads to action. You ever see a celebrity or an athlete on TV who's been caught doing something they're not supposed to do? And then they give their patented unapology, non-apology apology. And they say, I'm never doing that again. And they might be okay for a few weeks, maybe even a few months. But sooner or later, they're right back there. Because they didn't change their thinking. They're they're thinking in the same way that led them to make decisions that brought them to actions that got them into hot water in the first place. Here's where the difference between our perceptions of ourselves and others' perceptions of us come into play. Because we think my intentions were good. And other people, they see our actions. And and the results of those actions, those consequences, which isn't necessarily a bad word. There's consequences. Every action has a consequence. Those consequences hang out around us. They're, they're, They're like a cloud that surrounds us. The consequences of our actions. And when other people look at us, they see those consequences of our actions. They don't know 
our thinking and our intent. They see the consequences of those actions, and we have a word for what they call that. They call it our reputation. And so people see our reputation and the consequences of our actions that are hanging out around us. And if that reputation is bad, they don't want to be around you. If that reputation is good, I mean, that's like a, that's like a flower in bloom to a bee. People love to be around people of a good reputation. Nobody wants to be around people of a bad reputation, except maybe other people of a bad reputation. So if we want to be truly the hands and feet of Christ to the people around us, if we want to be the body of Christ, which is, we are told in the Bible that we, the gathered people of God, we are the body of Christ. If we truly want to be the body of Christ, our thinking has to mirror the thinking of Jesus, that when he encountered people whose lives were a mess, his first thought was, they need me. They need me was what he thought. He didn't think, man, their life is a mess. And if I help them, ah, they're probably just going to screw up again. Or, you know, they made the bed. They can sleep in it. I'll teach them how to make better decisions. That's not what Jesus said. He said, I'm going to go there. I'm going to be with them. They need me. Whether they're so, so when we look at people and our first inclination is, man, their life is a mess. As soon as we see that, the thought that comes into our mind is, I bet, I bet they could use somebody right now in their life because their life is a mess. And who wants to be around people whose life is a mess? other people whose life is a mess because nobody wants to be around them. So if we truly want to be Christ and carry the gospel in us, we need to reframe our thinking that when we see someone whose life is a mess and people who are struggling in life, our first thought is, I'll bet they need a friend. I'll bet they need someone in their life who can bring a little stability not by pounding them over the head with the law, but by living in their presence as a person whose life isn't a complete mess. Speaking for myself, I won't, I won't take out the word mess in my life. I'll say complete mess. And we bring stability to them that way. And healing. And instead of when we see somebody who doesn't live the way we think they're supposed to be living, even if we have good reason to think that, pointing the finger of judgment, they're already under judgment. One time Jesus said, I don't judge anybody. The Father judges, yes, but I don't judge anybody. Another time Paul wrote, for those who believe in Christ, there is no judgment. Not for those who don't sin. Yeah, for those who don't sin, there is no judgment. There's been one of those. You may have heard of him. His name is Jesus. The only human who doesn't stand under judgment. And even though he doesn't stand under judgment, he comes to those people who do. Somebody whose life is falling apart. Somebody whose life doesn't match what we believe their life should look like. They're already getting fingers pointed at them. They're already under the judgment of so many people. What we need to do in our thinking is mirror the thinking of Christ who saw those people and didn't judge them, but said, that person needs me. And we might not say that person needs me. We say that person needs Jesus, not in the form of you better believe and get your life in order, but they're hurting. And it's possible the only person that can bring them healing from their hurt is Jesus himself, through us. 
So I guess that's the solution. You asked me, what's the solution? That's the solution. Our thinking has to mirror the thinking of Christ in that we don't bring judgment, but that we bring healing and we bring the grace of God. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit. And and Paul wrote to Titus that the Holy Spirit will regenerate us and renew us. And we pray that that's what the Holy Spirit will do, that it will regenerate us and renew us so that we would have the mind of Christ. That when we see those people who struggle so deeply with life, that we don't become one more person pointing the finger at them, but we be the person who reaches out to them, to befriend them, the person who is you to them. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.